Hello and welcome back for a new episode of the Early Music Podcast, a series produced by Rema and dedicated to the future of the early music sector. My name is Yasmina Chernčić and this week we look at what the record industry is doing these days. The business model of recording has gone through significant changes recently due obviously to the arrival of digital opportunities for distribution and new habits for the listeners and CD buyers. Recording the music itself hasn't changed much, nor has up to a point the format of the CD. But the listeners' expectations do shift, and as a response, the labels and recording companies have to adapt. Our first guest today is Charles Adriansen, the founder and chairman of Outier Records, who is here as the first representative of a very singular trio formed by an artist or an ensemble with their ideas and identity, a sound engineer who turns the artist's idea and performance into a fixed medium, and the label who will ultimately make the record available for the world. Out here, as one of the major record labels active in the early music sector, is actually an umbrella label that is constituted of several other labels, such as Alpha, Arcana, Richard Carr, Lynn Records, and others. So my first question was, how does it work exactly from the inside? I would like to say originally we never really chose. I set up a small label and then the others came by chance. I heard that some were in difficult situations, some were too small to find their own markets. And so by and by I acquired a number of labels and you know by putting them under one roof we gave them the, the human and the technical means to become visible and to get to the market. I think there was only one very important criteria and that was quality in all aspects of their work. We didn't want rubbish labels. But now I'm not buying labels anymore. Uh, we're much more interested in organically growing them. Well, in the past, we started with a number of Baroque labels, but we had no contemporary music. I got the opportunity to buy a label called Eon, doing contemporary music, or we bought Alpha in France, which was a very strong ancient music label, but they had absolutely no, no, no presence in Germany or in Italy or in England or elsewhere. And so we decided to grow them organically, which means that I went to Germany and we started working with German artists. And so there was no need to buy a German label, as it were. It became a European label. Out Here Musics covers a large portion of the market, spanning over many different genres. What is your take on representing such diversity also in regards to early music? As I said before, when we acquired most labels, such as Alpha, Arcana, Richard Carr or, or Rame, they were mostly focused on Baroque and ancient music and were very much driven by repertoire. 15 years ago, mainstream classic was really in the hands of the major companies, Sony, Warner, Universal. But little by little, the majors stopped producing so many works because they couldn't make any profit. And we realized that we had to expand our offer to, to the public. And so now we have what I would call three eclectic labels who cover the whole range from ancient to contemporary and they are mostly artist-driven, and the rest have a very strong music, ancient music identity, and they're more repertoire-driven. Would you say there is room for an all-early music label? Well, there is room. I don't, think it's, I don't think there's much room for new entrants at this point, but we have all-early music labels, Richard Carr, Arcana and Ramey, and they are very successful in their own way. But of course, today... The market is relatively small. Uh, the buyers specifically interested in that kind of repertoire are a limited number. They are they're there, they're supporting us, they're buying. But there's another phenomenon, that's musical genres are becoming more blurred. So romantic music is played on ancient instruments, ancient music is played on contemporary instruments or on electronic instruments. So for me, it's important to keep the classification, and that's why we put different repertoires on different labels, to make it easier for the public, really. 
how does it work? Do you approach artists or do they approach you? When we started, we were begging artists to record and they would look at us and say, who are you? Today, we get an infinite amount of proposals from artists. And unfortunately, we're the ones who have to say uh, there's no room or, or yes, we'll do that because it's exceptional. We choose people we like. We choose it on the basis of, of, of love. There's no scientific formula. Some people come to us because they're being referred to us by, by other artists we produce or, or by, by their agencies. Some we, we find through competitions. Other want a better label or they want to have more artistic freedom than given by their own label. Before, talent was really the only criteria. You would find somebody in, who, would, who would be a fantastic artist. And that's still the number one. But today we're also looking at the ability of young artists to, to bring something fresh, to bring something different. Their commitment and, and also at their communication skills. And the last criteria maybe is geography. Uh, we've grown into, well, probably the biggest independent producer, maybe with the exception of Naxos. And so we're in many countries. And so we try to have a balance of French, Italian, German, Russian, Asian artists. So that's also a choice criteria. Speaking about innovation, what exactly would you say you expect from an artist? That has to do with the evolution of the public. In the past, you had a very disciplined and serious public, and you still have in some countries, like, like, like Germany or maybe like England, where people know what they're expecting, uh, they want to hear a certain repertoire, and they're really devoted to the, the, the talent and the concentration of the person who does it. But today, a very large part of the public is, is, is not ignorant, but is less used to, 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 to our music, to our classical music. And so they want an experience. And an experience is given by somebody who's, who's also a, a showman. And we're expecting of musicians also to, to, to communicate with their public, maybe to write, maybe to speak. So I think that's the visual aspect. The other aspect, of course, when you say something fresh, it means why is their approach worthwhile Uh, recording the same works that have been recorded by the greatest masters. Do they have something to say? And that's very subjective, but I mean, that's very important. So once we have a label and an artist who are willing to work together, let's move to the recording studio. And in that studio, the label is represented by the sound engineer. How does that work? Sound engineers are extraordinarily important elements of, of the whole operation. And great sound engineers, of course, are absolute stars. Some, some have their own signature sound. Some are very versatile and they adapt. The key factor for sound engineer is the, the relation that they develop with the artist during the work. They don't really shape the image of the artist, but they allow the artist to shape the image of himself or herself in the sound. Uh, that's a result of a common work. So some artists, you know, have their fetish engineers and, and, and many engineers have their fetish type of uh, ensemble, voice or space. So it's a very subtle relation. We, we work with quite a number of sound engineers with whom we've developed a relation of real trust. So, you know, we just tell them, here's, here's the program, go ahead and do it, and we trust them. And sometimes they save really difficult productions, you know, when musicians are in a bad day or when the recording conditions are... Or not optimal. So it's it's a it's a very strong and intense collaboration. We have ten labels in the group. Many of them are actually managed, run as artistic directors by South engineers. Ramé, Lynn Records, uh, Richard Carr. The artistic director is the sound engineer, so his, his grief, his pat. Uh, but I cannot say there's a common line uh, throughout all the labels, no. The marketing of a CD also starts very early, actually beginning with the choice of the program. What would you say the trends are here? What evolution can we perceive? There's an evolution. I mean, in the past, you were working with a public who knew what they wanted, and when, and when they wanted to see... Uh, you know, the, the, the new um, 
a new collection of, of Brahms sonatas or, or whatever, or back suites, they would go for that. Uh, today, I think it still constitutes the majority of what we're doing. It's uh, records of one composers or, 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 or one or two composers. But more and more, you see people who want to, to talk about their experience. And their experience is putting links, making a story. Uh, it's more the recital mode. And, um, and that's becoming very popular. People like to talk. I think it also has to do something with the fact that, you know, in playlists, people don't follow logic. They follow their taste and their intuition. And so, yeah, we do, we do more and more what I call recital discs. And who chooses? Is it the artist, the label, or someone else? It's really a dialogue. Uh, we are, we, unlike, you know, major companies, we produce a cultural good. A cultural good is the result of a dialogue between the artist and his publisher, as it were. So we, we talk, um, we look at what they want to do. We also wonder whether it's a good timing for them to do it, because, you know, if a major artist has just released the same repertoire, we'll tell him or her it's not the right time. We're very keen to select the works that fit the artist best at a certain time of his or her revolution. What we never do is impose a work for commercial reasons. That's not, that's not the way we work. It's interesting because there's a different consumption pattern for physical and for digital works. Um, in the physical world, people are still quite selective and they go for a certain repertoire or something specific. In the digital world, there's, there's again, there's more tendency of a relatively less educated public to go for big names and, and famous works. What do you think will happen in the future? I think that the CD format is no longer needed. Well, it's needed because it's still 70% of our income. But basically, it's, it has its limitation. It's the 70, 80 minutes. Uh, it's almost like an LP. You know, you had to think, I'm putting this on one face, what I'm going to put on the other side. Um, so today you can do lots of standalone works, and that's, that's what I like. It's like singles. It's um, also live audio, bits and pieces. There are different formats, publication formats possible, but I don't see anything beyond the, the, the digital streaming or downloading now. I think we have to distinguish two things, you know. Today, uh, many artists have been confined, they're alone, they're isolated. And they will get out anything to feel alive and to keep a, a link with their with their audience. And I can't blame them. And they do it for free, and it's generous, and it's nice. Of course, we have a slightly different point of view, because we say we are producing a cultural good. A cultural good is something that has a real value. It has a value of experience, of work, of hard work. And we don't like to see this being flogged on the market, you know, because in the end it's going to harm the artist's ability to generate income over the long term. But a good record, <laughs> there's, for me, it's, it's, just, it's simply a record you want to hear again and again. It's like a work of art. It, has, it needs a balance between you know, your gut emotions Uh, it needs great sound. It also needs a, a mentally satisfying trip. So it's a combination of all these things, like, like any real work of art. Let's talk a little bit about what the experience of recording brings to an artist once the recording has been made. How does your involvement in their career affect them? For us, it's the very core of our mission. Uh, it's our DNA. Um, and it's, it comes from history because our major labels like Alpha Richard Carr have literally grown uh, in parallel with the career of our artists. Uh, and the artists originally were virtually unknown, and now they, they have great careers. And today, uh, my biggest pride is to witness how, you know, a good recording we made with a relatively unknown artist has led to good reviews, uh, that led to concerts, that led to getting a, a decent agent, to new recordings, you know, better sales and, and a great career. It's, it's a virtuous cycle. And there's, for us, there's so many examples, you know, I think of Vox Luminis, of Christina Pluard, of recently of Justin Taylor, of uh, uh, Theodore Corensis, uh, I don't know, Les Musiciens de Saint-Julien, 
Leonardo Garcia Alarcón, Robin Ticciati, all these people we, we found, we discovered quite young, and we followed them. So for me, that, that, that's the, actually, that's why I'm doing this job, following people and developing their career. So we don't do one-night stands. We don't pick up a recording and say, well, sometimes we do because sometimes we try and it doesn't work out. But most of the time, we are so happy and proud to accompany people and see them succeed. That's our, you know, that's our greatest reward. Thank you very much, Charles Adrianson, for taking the time to share these thoughts with me. Let's now move on to a more technical aspect of the creation of an album, and that is the recording of the music by the artists and a sound engineer. For this, we met with Aline Blondiot, who is one of Out Here Records' most trusted sound specialists. My name is Aline Blondiot. I'm a sound engineer and producer, and I work in classical music to record CDs. I work with many different artists for different labels, such as Alpha, Harmonia Mundi, Warner, Mirare, and others. Can you tell us briefly about how the CDs are made? What are the steps in which you participate? The whole process from the recording itself to the release of the CD includes two steps, I would say. The recording itself and the post-production. For the recording itself, we need to find the right location to do it. The whole or the church that would serve the music, as it depends on the music we are recording, of course, but we need the acoustic adapted to the style of music we are recording. I'm thinking about Christian music, like Bach Cantadas or any, or any others. It's always nice to have it to record it in a church because it was written to be played in churches. But of course, a Brahms symphony shouldn't be recorded there or played there. And we, we would need a big hall, a big concert hall, with a nice acoustic for that. So it's, it's very difficult, actually, to find the right places for many reasons. Not because we don't know them, but because they're expensive or not often very free. And, but it's very important for a nice recording, actually. And then we have the post-production. When we have recorded all this material to make a nice CD, all that music, we have a lot of takes of it. Often we just replay, redo things to have a better quality, musically speaking. We redo takes to have a lot of material, to have the best of what we can have, musically speaking. So when we have recorded all that music, all together, we just go back home. I come back to my studio and I start the editing, which means choosing the best takes for every moment of the music and put it together, edit all together. When this work of editing is done, we send this first edit to the musicians and then they will just uh, let us know what they like, what they don't like, what they want us to change, uh, if they think they've played things differently or maybe we missed little mistakes or anything. And so we just correct, do the correction. Sometimes they try to come to do it, to do it with us, which is very nice so we can choose together and it's very interesting and nice to do it together. If they cannot come because the schedules are too busy and it's very difficult to organize, I just do it by myself and then I send them the second edit until everybody is happy. Then we do the mix. It depends really where we did record, if the sound was nice already over there at the balance and uh, during the recording or if we needed to work on it and add some uh, reverb or do a little bit of equalization. So when everybody is really happy about the, the editing and the, the mixing, we'll do the mastering, which is the last step to produce a master that uh, we will send to the CD pressing factory. What do you look for in an artist? What is for you the ideal relationship between you and them during the recording? I really believe that the most important things between an artist and us during a, a recording session is confidence, actually. They really have to, to trust us and what we are telling them about their playing and what we want them to re 
replay and, for, and the reason why we want them to replay things. We actually are the outside ear, the third one. And I believe that more they will trust us on what we are saying about their playing or on what and why we want them to replay things, more they will be willing to do it. And more we will have the nice material for editing, musically speaking, I mean, to finally get to the best and nicest version of their interpretation of the music they are playing, they are recording, which is the goal of all that. How do you think working with a musician could help them find their sound? Being the third year, do you give advice? Even if I record all those musics from all eras in the same way, with the same equipment, in the, in the same conditions, as long as it is acoustic. If we speak specifically about what we call early music, most of the time played on original instruments, it has to be very precise, obvious, high fidelity. I don't think we can truly really help a musician to find his own sound identity. But what I'm sure of is that we have to do everything we can to reproduce it on the tape, very precisely and accurately, as close as we would hear it in a live situation. And is there anything that you do with your sound engineering tools to support a certain aesthetic of early music? Uh, for example, in this situation of a recording of early music on original instruments, it's very important that we hear very nicely and clearly the, um, the timbre and the color of good strings for strings instruments. But we also need to hear the color of the temperament and the pitch and the specific articulation uh, that music requests. And like for all, all the others recordings, we need to have a very nice dynamic, a very good intonation between instruments and a very nice intensity of the sound, like for every recording. It's usually very difficult and hard for classical musicians to, to play and develop their sound in this kind of conditions, the conditions of a studio, for example. And as we know, they are the ones who are making the sound, they are the source of the sound. If it doesn't come well out of their instrument and of, out of their mind and fingers and voice, <laughs> It's going to be very hard for us on engineers to improve it. What I meant by saying that is that the, the acoustic conditions for recordings are not always ideal. But I really think that uh, we always try, all of us, musicians and sound engineers, to uh, serve the music and the sound the best we can. What do you think the future will bring regarding recordings? What can you predict? or hope for? I truly believe that music will always be recorded and the way we are doing it today. This music will always have to be played somewhere by musicians with their own interpretation and recorded by somebody with materials, microphones, computers. What is going to change for sure in the future is the support on what we're going to get that recorded music and the diffusion of it. It did change already a lot. Finally, what I hope the most is that people will continue to listen to that recorded music with headphones or even through loudspeakers, as they were doing before when we only had CDs to listen to recorded classical music. Thank you, Aline Blondiot, for taking the time to tell us more about what you do exactly, which is, of course, much more than installing just a few microphones and putting tracks together. The sound engineer is at the same time the producer of the CD and its first listener, so they can pretty much shape the raw music into the final product. This is why the relationship between the artist and the engineer or producer is so important. To investigate further, we thought we'd ask directly one performer who has been working with Aline a lot, and that is the French harpsichordist Jean Rondeau. So my name is Jean. My uh, main activity is focused on working on harpsichord music as a player. Actually, besides concerts, I'm very much passionate about the recording, which I consider as a, an art in itself. And not only, you know, a way of uh, doing promotion or whatever, but uh, for me, it's really something in itself. It's a whole universe in which I love to dig 
in with an enormous you know joy and curiosity and of course love you know among infinite different positive feelings and and sensation I recorded my first solo album six years ago, uh, dedicated to Bach music. And now I, I just released this month my last album. Uh, it was a duo with uh, Thomas Dunford on the on the lute, and all those solo album uh, was for uh, the label Warner Classics and Erato. So I did uh, with them uh, five albums, and actually uh, these different albums would not have been possible without Aline Blondio. Uh, so she's the sound engineer and uh, artistic director or producer or whatever the name we give to uh, her function. But, you know, since my first solo album, I could not consider recording without her, of course, for musical reason. But also far beyond that for a true human connection, we both created a profound friendship and a very strong working duo, let's say. From the first day of recording until the last listening of the mix, you know, uh, this relationship is essential for our work and for, for how we want to work also. We don't want to work with just someone because of his uh, function, but we really like and need the human connection we both have. But actually also for the recording, I, I we are working with also Jean-François Brun, uh, who is another friend of mine who take care of uh, tuning the harpsichord and uh, and you know regulate the instrument and uh, and he has also very important here he's listening also uh, the recording and he could give advice and help us how does it work exactly what happens when you work with her and and what do you discuss so let's say that for me the essential part of the process is based in the trust we, we share of the relationship we each have with music, the true love we share together for the music, for music in general. I really share that with Aline and I take a lot of pleasure first to really deeply love the music, you know, and uh, it seems a bit, you know, normal, but it's a very base. And uh, with this, this trust as a, let's say, a, a background, we listen to each other very carefully. And most of all, we try to start working without any a priori, you know, any preconceived ideas to have really fresh ears fresh uh, look at musical text. We are very attentive with the musical moment. We really try to be in the present and somehow we get to a point of excitement just as kids playing a game without realizing how much time has passed. What is her input? Is there some advice that you keep with you after the recording and which affects your performance? What is very important to me is not the function of sound engineer or producer or so-called artistic director, but the human being behind it. You know, the sound engineer, Aline, is the only real audience there when I record. The recording process is one that demands rawness. You cannot hide behind false pretenses to what take place musically and you really have to be in the present. The process of what we learn is how to be in this rawness, uh, how to be, you know, it's a metaphor, but to be naked, to be really deeply inside the musical text, inside the music. And you could not be shy in your relationship between you and the music. Now, what role do you give to your recordings in your artistic life as compared to your live performances? I think of recording as an event in itself with its own complexity. Nothing to do with uh, live performances. I think for me as a personal experience is that it's not helpful to try to reproduce the live performance into the recording. The recording has its own magical and mystical musical moments and you transmit through 
a different, somehow more complex, but a different channel than the live performances. The work is that you have to ask yourself how this channel is built, how does it work. The, the format of an album is, is more like a painting that is brought to life every time someone plays it. And I, I really like to consider this channel as a very specific way of sharing the music. And how do you look back now at your first try at recording? Would you have done it differently? What do you think about your first album today? I just I just could say that the, the sound Aline made for this uh, first recording about Bach music, the sound was very much extraordinary. I mean, we were very lucky to have like a, a combination of a very good acoustic, a very good harpsichord. And I remember that during the balance, something really magical happened and personally really loved the, the sound she she made. How does an ideal album look like for you, speaking as an artist or as a listener? An ideal album for me would be the one that grabs the listener by its ears and brings him into a wonderful journey. You tell a story, uh, an album which is full. Actually, an album needs to be full of ideas, thoughts, and, and most of all, rumination. But all of that, it's not explicit or seamless. It's not the goal to show the ideas. The ideas are hidden, you know, and and the, the purpose is really much the story. It's very much like a, a novel. The goal is to bring the listener into a timeless magical dance. The idea is to forget about the time, you know, a bit like when you read like a very, very good novel. And where do you think lies the future of recordings from a performer's point of view, but also maybe as a listener? Recording is a very fresh and young art, approximately one century ago that it exists. But it already has evolved a lot with uh, periods of uh, experimentation and also period of uh, traditions. These arts tools are very much connected with technology, of course, in terms of forms and formats. And from this point of view, uh, the last 30 years has known a major expansion and evolutions. On the other hand, the technological progress has nothing to do with the artistic intentions. I don't know what is the future of CD recording, but I'm, I'm very much curious about what will happen which new ideas will will come up and, and all this question of this channel between you recording and someone listening uh, at home or also how how the how the audience listen to the to the CD to the album. We have heard how the most traditional way to record an album goes, from the point of view of the label, the sound engineer, and the artist. These are the three protagonists that we chose to focus on today, though, of course, many other professionals are needed before the recording and after to create an album. The specificity of any music with a harpsichord being, as Jean Rondeau pointed out, requiring a tuner on set, for example. Let's give way now to other models of recording music with our next guests. First, let's welcome Peter Vehi and Tina Jokinen from ERP. This Estonian record company is actually much more than a record producer. They also produce the festival Glasperlenspiel and the festival Orient, among other projects. So my name is Tina Jokinen. I am the general manager for ERP, which is uh, the abbreviation of Estonian record productions. Our company is not, of course, only the record production company. We do have artist management, maybe in a, a smaller scale, or not maybe, but surely for a smaller scale. But we also own the labels of two festivals. Uh, one of them is um, Glass Berlin Spiel, after Hermann Hesse's famous novel. And this is dedicated to Western classical music and early music, and also new and avant-garde. Basically, we do not very much discriminate. 
My name is Peter Rahi. I'm a music composer. Also, I am artistic director for uh, ERP. We started from record productions, but maybe today if the f- music festivals are, I believe, m- more important. We produce only maybe 10 or 12 records per year. It is not so much, but um, much more we work with concerts. We have also artist management, but this is maybe activity number four or three or five, not our main activity. Because a lot of the life of uh, musicians is um, actually spent on board the aircraft and at the hotels. Since we do have the competency in our company, including myself, who has an airline background, we decided that we will not give that money to travel agencies, but we make one of our own. And since we also have the competency of cargo logistics, we decided that orchestras don't need to pay to 100 plus one cargo agencies. There are shipping agencies, that's a wild forest. So we founded one of our own. May I ask, how did you become such a diversified company? Any entrepreneur with any foresight whatsoever is aimed on, um, on a sustainable uh, enterprise and knowing that actually things are in constant change. Meaning that, uh, for example, Uh, when, like now, travel, which has always been an eternal um, creator of cash flow at least, is down to zero. There is no turnover whatsoever. At the same time, cargo is moving because, well, people and countries and organizations and institutions need a lot of stuff, maybe even more, now when they can't travel themselves. So uh, those things, well, are just uh, sort of intertwined and one substitutes for another and one supports the other. And uh, also, since those are the services that are actually needed, because let's start, let's go back to the point, the initial point, the starting point where we started as a record production, that means we needed artists, that means we needed the movements. So not only musical movements, but the physical movements. So ergo, and we did have the competency then, obviously, we decided uh, we will will make it as it is, maybe not with a very clear vision. So those things grew out from one another, but uh, the main point is that uh, while a lot of musicians, in my understanding, or artists per se as well, are um, uh, designing companies, well, which is all too easy to found a company, actually, to establish a company nowadays, they do it for a project. Whereas I hate the notion that a company is a project. A company cannot be a project because you employ people, you pay taxes, you're responsible. So it is not a planned vision, but merely an evolution that follows the market. The main focus of your company may shift with the years. We all know what happened to record productions, the classical ones. I mean, the, like the, the ones that we used to know that you record an artist, you pay to the artist, you release a recording and you sell it and you make huge profit. We know what happened to it. Nothing. It doesn't exist even anymore. Everything is totally different today. Plus, the physical records are not dead at all. Maybe they are even growing in their importance, but they are growing in a very, very different sector. That's the collector's item. It's, you know, like uh, handmade jewels. Well, first, when uh, all jewels were historically handmade, and then when factories came, everybody wanted to have those factory jewels. And then now all of a sudden, we all want the handmade or, or artist made so on and so forth. It's the same with records, actually. But it's, it, it isn't a central activity anymore. Currently, I would say the festivals are the core activity at the moment. Well, what happens in one year? What happens in half a year? Who knows? 
What is the place of early music in your company's festival and records? We have in our record catalog a lot of early music. Also, if we see our festival programs, there are also many, many early music performers. Maybe number, absolutely number one in Estonia is ensemble Hortus Musicus. We have 20 years co cooperation and um, they are not un uh, under our management, but just re re recording businesses. There is music before Baroque as well. It's even earlier. Like this year, for instance, uh, we are even going as far back. Uh, we are talking about the music from ancient Greece, so as early as it gets. Uh, it does play an important role, but again, uh, we have to stress that the connecting point has to be there with one idea or another which comes from the outside of, uh, of just being early music. So the concept is what matters, the red thread. Is that something that your CD buyers are looking for? We have to actually make a difference if we're talking here about recordings or concerts. They, they are very different things because the concerts is actually the kitchen where the live art is born. Going over to recordings, so I think that the power lines are a little bit different there. This is not that you have to invent uh, that extra dimension, because today all the music, almost all the music that is being played, can be um, also attained from, uh, from the internet. One way or the other, we are live streaming, then later these live stream concerts will be edited and they will go into our 24-7 radio. So here, I would say good music is important. Whatever idea, because people can combine everything by themselves according to their tastes, their mood, their whatever. So, so this is something that you have to do well with high quality and make it available, be it then physical records or be it digital access, whatever, but um, leave the choice to the listener and make it as accessible as possible. And the last question, what is the future of hard copy CDs? What do you foresee? Yes, there were times when it was this big gramophones, you know, it was a kind of like a craftsmanship. And then the mass production started and uh, everybody was buying those mass produced things. Today, again, uh, the mass production has shifted into internet. So this is digital, actually. The connoisseurs and the people with means and with love for music, uh, reading books versus Kindle or reading anything from your screen. So. That's the same thing. So I don't think it disappears anywhere. The prices are going higher. The releases are going f are getting fewer and um, like more upmarket. Uh, the quality is getting higher also of the of the sleeve. I mean of the of the digi box or whatever. It's more artwork. It's maybe even more text, more information, anything because this is. This is an exclusive thing now. So the better quality, the better artistic idea, the better chances. And I think in that sense, nothing has changed. Thank you, Tina and Peter, for sharing your experience with us today. It seems that ERP chose a position that is different from out here strategy. They are diversifying their activities to stay competitive, but choose to keep producing hard copies as collectibles. And our last guest today is Alex McCartney, a lutenist who came to record his own work almost by himself through his own micro-label, Vetero Musica. So he can speak from his position as a performer, but with the experience of a label manager. My name's Alex McCartney. I'm a lute and theorbo player based in Scotland in the UK. I work with uh, quite a few ensembles and orchestras and soloists in the UK, predominantly as an accompanist, but occasionally uh, playing solo concertos or whatever. Um, the group, the type of groups I play with are the Academy of Ancient Music, the English Concert, the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment, uh, the Sixteen, uh, most, 
most groups in the UK share a lot of players. So uh, that's the basis of my work alongside uh, a lot of duo work with people like Tabea Davis and uh, Alison Balsam, people like that. How did you begin recording your own CDs? I started recording with a friend when I was at university at the Guildhall uh, School of Music and Drama in London. And we had a we had an ensemble together uh, with a few other players. And as part of our sort of outreach or marketing and just general interest, uh, we decided to start recording ourselves. Um, and it was it was sort of for two reasons, really. The first was that uh, actually making a recording at that time uh, that we'd be proud of. I'm not sure we would have um, been very pleased with, with because we, we were a new ensemble. So you know things were things were rusty and new. Um, and then also the the cost of making a recording of, at that time to make a CD or something was really inhibitive to a to a young ensemble and without uh, winning a, a big competition or something like that. Uh, a, you know, a CD deal with a label or something like that wasn't wasn't possible for us uh, without a lot of a lot of work. And I think we wanted to develop a practice that involved recording as a central part of it, and to not be afraid to do that. Uh, so we, yeah, uh, we had a residency in a in a local church in North London, and the church kindly let us regularly make CD recordings in there or or album recordings. Um, that we often predominantly initially just distributed online or used, uh, you know, with a sort of cheap uh, photo montage background, you know, the sort of uh, early days of, of marketing, that sort of thing. And yeah, we, we probably made about 10 albums worth of recordings in that, in that short period of about three and three and a half years. The first set of recordings we made with our group, uh, Poetical Music, tended to be uh, just related to what repertoire we were interested in exploring at the time. So much of it was very obscure, uh, or obscure to us at the time, it was obscure 17th century music because uh, the group lineup had uh, a lute and a harp and, uh, and a spinet and things like that. So uh, we didn't really do your your pieces of Bach or bits of the repertoire that are, that are more often played. So the first few albums um, were things uh, were called like Canarios and they would involve a sort of juxtaposition of birds, organ music with some lute music uh, by Capsberger and things like that uh, interspersed. And then eventually we started to, I guess, uh, think more carefully about what we were doing and develop albums that had more of a a stronger concept um, and this resulted in things like the album that we made called Majesty which is which includes uh, some Lesson de Tenebre by um, De Lalande and some Couperin as well. How do you look back nowadays at the albums you produced then? Do you think differently after even a couple of years of experience? Now uh, when I come to make a, a CD or an album it, it tends to have a much stronger concept and program that gives it a good foundation. Much of the early work we did in recording uh, was just experimental in that we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, so there, there was a lot of um, I guess uh, sort of trial and improvement and much of say like the early designs of the CD the CDs or, or um, yeah, even just the program were what I would probably call fairly weak now. And that when I would come to an album uh, now, uh, today, I would approach it in a completely different way. But that's mainly as a result of having a greater understanding of how we use anything from audio editing software to, you know, designing the booklet and organizing the program notes or everything. So uh, basically the longer you've spent doing it the more the more you'll understand how to manipulate it and therefore the more control you can get over uh, the the product or uh, concept album or whatever it is that you're creating. What difference do you see between recording and in particular self-recording and performing live? Do you separate the two or would you say that one is an opportunity for expressing something that the other can convey? 
I think uh, performance and live performance, I should say, and recording are fairly separate strands as far as I think about them. The recording process is a feels like a very different type of practice, and as as someone who participates in both fairly fully, uh, I can really feel uh, a, a fair difference between the two. Perhaps live performance. I think of more as in the moment, and I would be more likely uh, to do things like improvisations that I probably couldn't attempt to repeat in a live performance, whereas that's the most irritating thing for a, an, a producer of an album, and as a performer who produces albums, I think I'm personally quite better at restricting myself in certain directions like improvisation in early music where unless you can do it exactly the way you want it in one take and you're willing to risk keeping that one take it just poses a, a different situation the thing that i like the most about self-production is having total control over the album or the, the concept of the recording down to things that you wouldn't normally be able to control as a performer. I can control everything from the type of sound produced from a particular type of microphone to whether the image on the front of the booklet or the actual album um, actually ties in thematically in a way that works in my in my head and my vision for the project to how the text in the booklet is set out. What's nice about it is that you have that total control in a way that when I've worked with other record labels as a performer, uh, these things are not afforded to you often. Often what's done is, is done in order to make the CD as marketable as possible. Whereas um, perhaps it's obvious from some of my albums that they were not really designed to be mass marketable or to get the you know the editor's award of the month or whatever they're not designed in that way at all they're very much designed to be their own sort of concept and and a unique one at that the thing that i like least about self producing is that whilst you're recording as a performer you're often thinking about all of the other things to do with the production of the album. And even if you have a friend engineering or producing, it's very hard if you understand all of those processes and how your playing fits into it. To make that constantly align with whoever is engineering and producing your album, uh, particularly if you have strong thoughts about it, which if you are used to self-producing and making these things, uh, you may well do. If you are the performer who's making your own CDs, like from my perspective, um, it's well worth me producing these things because they, um, and having control over all of that, because the uh, money you get back from it is far, far more than you'd get from a, a label, from working with someone else. And there's no initial huge outgoing. And what is your vision for the future? Where do you see your CDs going, their album format, or even your own label? The, the situation, particularly for performers and labels, is one that's changed dramatically over the last uh, even even 30 years. Now that making, basically selling CDs is not profitable to the performer, it's only really used as a marketing tact, it, it sort of leaves the door open for other uses of, of this recorded music. I also think that people are less keen to pay for just audio recordings anymore. And I think it's got something to do with the amount of distraction that they can often allow themselves to have whilst uh, listening to these things in the way that live performance doesn't really allow. You know, you can't wander off and uh, make a coffee in the middle of a concert, whereas you can do that whilst you listen to a CD. So I, my prediction, if, I, if I'm allowed to make a prediction, would be 
that I would suspect there'll be some sort of heavier integration of audio recordings into other environments. And I don't really know whether that would be, for example, the, the video game environment, because it would be possible, for example, to create a digital environment that would be more comparable to a distraction-free concert environment in a digital space in a way that it's not really possible to do with Spotify or or YouTube or many other channels that people listen to music on. And I think this will all sort of fall back on the performer in a way because the performer uh, is currently in a situation where they often, if they're not very famous, if they will often have to put a lot of money into making a recording and then consider it to be marketing because it's unlikely that they'll make a significant amount of money from it. So I wouldn't be surprised if things went in that sort of direction where environments were more controlled for the listening uh, of audio. Yes, what if we use the possibilities of video games to create new immersive experiences for recorded music? Let's take some time to imagine what this would be like and for once, let's give this podcast a positive ending. I hope you enjoyed this episode and will join us for more. And I must say that it was particularly difficult to choose one particular piece of music to illustrate this recording topic, so we apologize for not being able to showcase the work of each of our guests. This podcast series is a preparation for the upcoming European Early Music Summit that will take place in Beaux-Arts in November 2020 in partnership with the AEC. It will assess the state of early music today and take a critical look at its practices and evolution. Each episode of our podcast is dedicated to one topic that will be debated during this three-day conference. So stay tuned for more.